And our Father in heaven, we're thankful. Lord, sometimes we can't even put words to our thanks. But Lord, our hope, our peace, our joy are only achieved through the love you showed for us, the sacrifice you made for us, and the resurrection, the empty tomb, that you do have power and authority over death. So Lord, we're thankful that you care enough about us to save us. And not give us what we deserve, but give us something so much better. Lord, as we come before your throne today, just clear our heads, clear our hearts, clear our minds. Lord, just let us rest in you. Let us hear your word. Lord, let us realize that you do keep your promises, your commitment, your covenants that you make with your people. And Lord, let us move forward with that hope and proclaim the name above all names. Lord, give us that courage, that strength, and that wisdom to move and to rejoice in the name of you. Amen. Our uh, first foray into the scripture this morning comes from Psalm 22. Most of us are familiar with uh, Isaiah 53 are probably not as familiar with Psalm 22. And the title that David gave is, Why Have You Forsaken Me? And it's, it's a psalm of David, but it's a prophecy of Christ. Listen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you, our fathers, trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you, they cried and were rescued, and you, they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from my mother's womb. You made me to trust you at my mother's breasts. On you I was cast from my birth. And from the womb you have been my God. Be not far from me. For trouble is near and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast, and my strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws, you lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircle me, they pierce my hands and feet. They divide my garments among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O oh Lord, do not be far off. O oh, you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Save me from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. All you offspring of Israel, stand in awe of him. And glorify him, all you offspring of Jacob. 
For he has not abhorred or despised the affliction of the afflicted, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and return to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. They shall bow before him all who go down to the dust of death, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him, for it shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. Amen. Our children will also serve him. Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous acts will be told to those yet, not yet born. They will hear about everything he has done. He has done it. It's, uh, it's amazing when we look back into the Old Testament. It reveals Christ. It reveals our Savior. Sometimes we'll read things and sometimes we, we'll wonder and we'll say, well, well who's it talking about? Or, or even the nation of Israel had trouble understanding that the Old Testament was about Christ, was about the Savior, was about the plan of God, what He was doing. Our children will serve Him Future generations will hear about the wonders of the Lord. His righteous act will be told to those not yet born. I guess the question to me is how? 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 I guess that's a question for each one of us. How can they... Reciting that verse from, from Romans. How can they hear if somebody doesn't tell them? And how can somebody tell them if they don't go? And how can they go if somebody doesn't send them? Right? Blessed are the feet on the mountains of him who brings good news. Good news. Remember, there's a prophecy that says we will proclaim Christ. He did it. We're just proclaiming. We're just proclaiming. Amen? Wow. What a powerful God we have. Amen. And He loves us. Today's reading comes from the Gospel of John. John was an eyewitness to the crucifixion. What we're going to be reading today is from God through John who was there at the cross. It's going to be the Gospel of John, chapter 19. I'm actually backing up half a verse into 15. And Don's looking at me wondering why. To the verse 15. Half a verse 15. No, I'm not going to... I was concerned because 15 through 19 is quite a... Enjoy it. Oh. That's true. <laughs> and that wouldn't always be bad, folks, well, as, the, as the Lord leads. Absolutely. All right, so this is John writing to us as God wants us to know. Um, second half of verse 15. Pilate said to them, the chief priests, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus 
And he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him with and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews. Rather, this man said that he was king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. So when the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. From that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. <sighs> After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. He bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Lord, bless the reading of this scripture. May it rest in our hearts, especially over the next couple weeks. Use it to strengthen and encourage us in the days of trouble that we see, knowing that you don't leave us nor forsake us, that you'll be with us always. In Jesus' name, amen. I didn't have my mic. Sorry. They asked Jesus an interesting question early on in his ministry. And Jesus says, I'm not here to abolish the law. I'm here to fulfill it. And when we see the scripture reveal what happened on the cross, we see that Jesus is keenly aware, even in his pain and suffering, of what the requirement to fulfill the law is. And what does he do? He doesn't shirk his responsibility. He fulfills the law. And we read it in John's Gospel. We read it in the other Gospel. And, you know, that's a, a challenge to us sometimes. Because it is, it is a difficult road, isn't it? You know, to get to Resurrection Sunday, first have to walk through Golgotha, place of the skull. How many people have walked through Golgotha? How many people think they live in Golgotha? 
how many people look around and say, wow. <laughs> but you know what? To get to new life, especially for people we know, we may have to go through hell. You know, we, we have to. You know, Isaiah says, you know, make the curved road straight, fill in the, the low places and, and get the flatten out the bumps and make a highway for God. That, that's some construction work to be done. That's some construction work to be done. And for, for us to, to experience that resurrected life, we have to walk that road. Because that's the road to Christ. So we're, you know, last week we started, this week we're going to continue, and there's some words that Christ uttered from the cross that I think are significant, and we need to take note of those words. So I have 16 up here. I didn't go back to 15, and, and maybe I should have. And Kevin, thank you for that. And verse 15, there was a question about who they were crucifying. Okay, and, and, and it says, Then Pilate turned Jesus over to be crucified, so they took Jesus away, carrying the cross by himself. He went to the place called the Place of the Skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. They nailed, there they nailed him to a, the cross. Two others were crucified with him, one on either side, with Jesus between them. And Pilate posted a sign on the cross that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. The place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, so that many people could read it. The King of the Jews. What authority did Pilate have to put that label on Christ? He's a Roman. How can he proclaim him the King of the Jews? Okay, all right. We're, we're wondering if maybe God was involved in this right. statement. And we're going to read, you know, as we read further on, we're going to see that he stuck by it. But, but the Jews gave him the right to do that because they brought Jesus to him to be judged. Right? And what conclusion did Pilate make? This, that's right. He's an innocent man. He is the king of the Jews. Right? And, and that didn't sit well with the teachers, but talk about identity. You know, we talked a little bit about this the last few weeks. We started Wednesday night, we continued Friday, and we're going to talk about it. What do you identify as? And no, this isn't. <laughs> what, do you, what label do you wear? Right. I mean, Roger, he's got a label on. What's that say? If you don't know me, you're not from around here. He's a living legend. That's what Roger's label says today. Brian's a Jeep, broken down on the side of the road. No. I see Terry and Kevin, so they've got labels back there. But, but what labels do we wear? How do people identify us? Would Pilate have been able to come to the conclusion about us, if he put us on trial, that we are Christian? That we are Christ-like? That we live a life that reflects the character of God? See, Pilate's in a position where he doesn't have to agree and follow Christ. He's not in a position to surrender and submit to Christ, although he does need to. He's just, a, you're, you're, you're presenting the evidence to me. I'm just telling you what I see. I'm just telling you what I see. And so, you know, I, I wonder what our sign should say. You know, I, I forbid they nail us to a tree. Okay, and they, they put us on a cross. What, what sign would they put up above us? You know, there's a clue. God has a sign. You know that? Do you know what label God puts on us? Faithful servant. Well done, my good faithful servant. If what if we we do his command 
And, and when we stand before God, we, it's not what we did, but what He did through us. But it's what Christ did on the cross that matters. That's all that matters. And, and whether we succeed or fail, it doesn't matter. Were we faithful servants? Did we surrender to the authority of Christ? You know, we wear a lot of signs and a lot of, <laughs> and we, we, we do a lot of things, but what is our identity? You know, we, we, Isaiah 43 1. I created you. I redeemed you. I called you by name. You are mine. Is there any doubt what identity we should have? Is there any doubt how we should be identified? I don't think so. I don't think so. And I think if we're identified that way, there, there, has to be, somebody has to be able to figure that out. We has to be able to figure that out. And Pilate said, King of the Jews. Right? And it says, the leading priests objected to that and said to Pilate, change it. Change it from the King of the Jews to, he said I am the King of the Jews. Why is that? Why do you think they wanted them to change it? They didn't want the blood on their hands. They didn't want to identify him as the king of the Jews. They didn't want to admit that this was the Messiah. And they nailed him to a cross. And Pilate replied, no. What I have written, I have written. What I have written, I have written. Think about that. How much success do we have at changing other people's opinions? <laughs> right? And, and we can be the greatest example of God's love and still not be received by everybody. How do I know that? Because the perfect example was crucified. And I'm not perfect. I'm not close to being perfect. I make efforts to be perfect. I strive, as the Scripture tells me, to be perfect, but I'm not perfect. So we can't. We can't. But we can do what? Our our, 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 we can make efforts and he gives us the provision of forgiveness so that when we don't see we can dust ourselves off and keep going right we can dust ourselves off and keep going and keep striving and that, and that is when we receive the forgiveness of God it is an identification that we believe and that he said he could do it for us right That's a difficult sign to read, isn't it? How would you feel if you stood there before the cross and you read King of the Jews? What would go through your mind as a Jew? Why is my king on a cross? Right? What would go through your mind if you weren't a Jew? Why is their king on a cross? How, how does this make sense? How, how do we process it? Did they really crucify the king of the Jews? Did they? The Jewish leaders didn't want to be remembered for that. It's challenging to process that our God Gave his life up for us. That he allowed himself to be crucified for us. And in that lies a prompting for each one of us that anything short of that is not enough for us to give back to him. 
for us to say, it's, no, nah, it's not worth it, or I, I don't have time, or, or maybe somebody else. Okay, now, now folks, I'm not, I'm not saying we're all perfect in this, I'm not, but, but Jesus said, as my Father in heaven strive to be perfect. Okay, we're going to be at different points in our journey, and there's going to be different points where it's going to be, yes, I'm going. And there's going to be other points, eh, eh, maybe that's not for me. Okay? And we're going to struggle with that. And that's okay. But always remember that that promise that's out there is that it's covered. It's taken care of. Keep going. Keep striving. Why? Because the king of the Jews allowed himself to be crucified so that we could be forgiven. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they divided his clothes among the four of them. They also took his robe, but it was seamless, woven in one piece, top to bottom. So they said, rather than tearing it apart, let us throw dice for it. Why? Because it was more valuable as one piece than it was as four little pieces. And soldiers aren't necessarily... Uh, good at things, but they're good at recognizing value <laughs> of things. And they said, uh, let us throw dice for it. They f this fulfilled the scripture that says, they divided my garments among themselves and threw dice for my clothing. So that is what they did. That comes from Psalm twenty-two, eighteen. 18. They divided my garments among themselves and threw dice, cast lots for my clothing. He didn't have much, but what he had, David told us what was going to happen, right? You know, it's interesting when we, we look at fulfillment of the scripture. How does that encouraging to us? Why does it mean to us? It means God keeps his promises. It means God has a plan and he planned it out, and, and he told us about it beforehand, and he followed through with it. What should we conclude from that? If God is with us, who can be against us? Right? If God's in this, I'm in the right place, right? If I'm standing with God, and he knows the deal, and knows the plan, and knows the future, and knows everything, I'm in a good place, aren't I? That, that doesn't mean we're in a comfortable place. That doesn't mean we, we've got it covered and we're good. It, that, that's something that's a different... It means I'm standing with God and no matter what happens, what? I'm okay. Now, we read about some of those adventures in, in Acts and we're going to read some more about those adventures in Acts. Do you think Paul and Barnabas were always comfortable and secure on their journey? We've only read their first journey. What's amazing to me is there's journey two and three. <laughs> After I came home and I almost got killed, and then and and I had to sneak out of town because they were going to kill me there too. I'm not sure I want to get back in and go again, right? But in this, we find the fulfillment of Scripture. When we see, and it, and it's not just we got to go searching for it. It says to fulfill the Scripture. John wrote to fulfill the Scripture. This is what happened. God knew it was going to happen, didn't he? And that's encouraging. Standing near the cross were Jesus' mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother standing there beside the disciple he loved, and that's, uh, for those that know, that's John, the writer of the Gospel. He, I don't believe he ever wrote himself as John, he always wrote the disciple he loved. And we'll see, we see it in other passages in John. And he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. And he said to his disciple, Here is your mother. And from then on, the disciple took her into his home. Now, there's been some research. Well, where is Joseph? Mary's husband. Uh, somewhere along the line, he departed the scene. Um, I'm not... I believe he died. Um, 
there's really not, it's not biblically recorded. So anything that says or suffices to say, it, he's just, we know that he wasn't there. That's, that's what we know. And at this point, Mary needed someone to take care of her because her oldest son, according to Jewish law, she was a widow. And she wasn't allowed, she didn't have the means to take care of herself, so she needed someone who would take care of her. And Jesus appointed John to do that. What's interesting is he appointed her from where? On the cross. Guys, he's dying. <laughs> okay. I mean, you know, think about this. I mean, we go through some rough stuff, don't we? And and sometimes when we're in the in the battle, we get so internally focused that we forget about those around us, don't we? Christ didn't forget. Christ didn't forget in the midst of of his dying on the cross, he made sure his mother was taken care of. Why do you think he done that? Done that. Excuse me. Why do you think he did that? Wow. I've been hanging around with too many Southerners lately. I wrote a note the other day, and it said, y'all, and my text, and my voice text said, why, comma, all? And I said, no, all of you. <laughs> so, well, why do you think he done that? <laughs> Even in his distress, he doesn't violate the law. What is the commandment that says, honor your mother and father? Right? And what did he do? He honored his mother by making provision for her in his absence. You see, if he didn't do that, they would have, and I'm sure they would have, pointed to the fact that he dishonored his mother and therefore, he broke the law, and he couldn't have been the Messiah. I'm sure they were looking for every little speck that they could find to say he violated the law. He makes provision for her needs. But that also indicates to us he's going to make provision for our needs. Right? Is that, did David make a prophecy similar? to that? Psalm 23, 1. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. God will provide for our needs. That's consistent with his word, isn't it? And, and his degree of distress, his degree of focusing on what's going on at the time has nothing to do with his ability to fulfill the commitment and promises that he He will provide for our need. Jesus knew that his mission was now finished. And to fulfill the scripture, he said, I am thirsty. A jar of sour wine was sitting there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop or hyssop, i.e., hyssop branch and held it up to his lips. Psalm 22, 15. Now you understand why we were in Psalm 22. I thirst. Because my strength has dried up like sun-baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You have laid me in the dust and left me for dead. Hmm. I thirst. I thirst. He fulfilled the scripture. He carried our burdens to the cross. He shed his blood for our forgiveness. When Jesus tasted it, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head. 